Chapter 6. I meet Mrs. Knight and my teenage years leaving school. My first recollection of any religious person having any effect on my life was when I was about to leave school at the age of 15 years old. My mother had spoken to Mr. K. H. Knight, who was the proprietor of Central Bucks TV, and had arranged for me to have a part-time job working after school and on a Saturday. This was until I left school, to take up full-time work as an apprentice for Mr. Knight. I'm told, years later, that my letter of job application was so badly written and the spelling so awful, it was laughable. However, I was taken on despite my inability to read or spell, or use correct grammar, or read properly. This was during my last year at school. I first met Mrs. Grace Knight on Saturday morning, whilst working for her husband, Ken. She was on hot pursuit of her husband and shouting at him for doing something that she disapproved of. I was in the workshop with Norman Garrett, the other apprentice, and I thought, wow, what an awful dragon of a woman, and pitied Mr. Knight from that moment on. Through Mr. Knight, as Ken Knight, I was introduced to the radio and television servicing trade and often went with him on customers' houses to repair TV sets and install television aerials. I spent many hours with Ken, going to people's homes, and soon learned that he was not faithful to his wife. Not that it bothered me, as I knew from Grace was like, from her first meeting. The idea of sexual promiscuity was very attractive to me. When we went round enjoying ourselves, Mrs Knight would often be left at home in the workshop minding their two children, Alison and Mark. They also had a big dog called Rufus. By this time I had left school, and was interested in our band, as I wanted to make music. Ian Mayer was the bass guitarist, and he built his own guitar amplifier, from a circuit diagram that was published in the wireless world. He built this amplifier, and I helped him build a speaker cabinet, and we used this for future gigs. I soon began to realise the things I enjoyed were the things that Mrs Knight did not approve of, or found interesting. I thought she was a right killjoy, and was boring. She was a Christian, whatever that meant, and I soon realised her values were not the same as mine. What I considered good and enjoyable, she would call it sin and sinful. She would often complain to her husband that I was always with him, and he gave her no time. It seemed she was often driven to despair by him, never being in on time and being very unreliable, and would often leave her for hours whilst he was out working on jobs. On one occasion, Norma Garrett's mother complained to Mrs Knight that Norman, her son, was not getting the training that he needed because Ken was always taking me out with him. I heard this conversation over the shop's intercom. Mrs Knight said that I was a nuisance and she did not like me one bit and it was not good that I should be out with her husband all the time. Upon hearing this I felt angry and went down the stairs to where they were and confronted them saying that I had overheard what they'd said about me. They were embarrassed and I'm sure this did not help our relationship. I really thought Mrs Knight was an ogre. I began to attend Luton College of Technology to learn about radio and television servicing and travelled by bus one day a week from Aylesbury to Luton. It was about an hour and a half's journey. I think it must have been due to Mrs Knight and her religion that I began to notice the texts of scripture put on what they call wayside pulpits. I began to memorise the verses such as Righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. And another, Jesus said, If you find life difficult, learn of me, and the burden that I will give you will not be too difficult to carry. At that time I had no idea of the meaning of these texts of scripture, but found it amusing to quote them to Mrs Knight at any appropriate time or moment, thinking I would embarrass her. On one occasion, I remember being dressed in an old blanket made into an undercoat for my brother's mod anorak. I was standing on the corner of the street near the workshop in Aylesbury one Saturday morning with Mr and Mrs Knight, and I quoted at the top of my voice these two scriptures in order to embarrass Mrs Knight. I'm not sure how they felt about it, but little did I know that one day I would learn the truth of these texts and become a preacher of the gospel myself. Mrs Grace Knight became a great help to me and lived until 2001. Here is a link to the video for her funeral entitled Obituary Mrs Maud Grace Knight. 
A confident 15-year-old. I enjoyed working with Mr Knight because he seemed to appreciate my help and abilities and would trust me to drive the van at 15 years old. On one occasion, he was short of a driver and had to deliver a television set, so he dressed me up in a sheepskin coat and gave me dark glasses to wear and with instructions to, to deliver this set to a house in Quarrenden. I was very pleased to do this, even more when it turned out that I was delivering the TV set to one of my school friends called Gillespie. On another occasion, I was given a job of replacing the complete intermediate frequency board on a new Ferguson 850 TV set in the customer's home. A qualified engineer in a workshop setting would normally have done this, but this unconventional approach was normal to me. Mr Knight had every confidence in me at the age of 15 years old. I'm sure the customer was not at all happy at this 15-year-old repairing their lovely brand new television set. During this time, I was still making music in the group, and when I was 16, Mr Knight's business failed and went into liquidation. So I found myself another job. I got an apprenticeship with Sailor Mellor, the radio and TV shop in Aylesbury. I worked there until I got into trouble with the police and was sacked at the age of 17 and was sent to Borstal. A holiday in Newquay. At this time, Mum and Dad took me and my sister Margaret, who was about three years old, to Newquay for a holiday. I didn't know what kind of place it was, but when I got there it was great. The sand and the sea and the surfing and the views were a treat to see. This was here that I conducted my first blag, that is a scam. As I wanted to explore the Headlands Hotel, which was an impressive hotel. Anyway, on this occasion I took Margaret by the hand and we walked down the driveway right into the hotel. As we approached, a steward of some kind came up to me and asked if he could help. I confidently replied, no thank you, we're staying here. He stood upright in embarrassment and said, oh yes, I remember the little girl. So we blagged it and I wandered around the hotel with my three-year-old sister admiring the hotel. The Headlands Hotel was in fact the hotel where they filmed the witches. My brother and I were to return to Newquay for a holiday in 1967, just before we were both sent to prison. It was after this that I decided I wanted to play the electric guitar, and I remember a lad called Alan Lawrence from the Tring Secondary Modern School having an electric guitar and bringing that to school. He plugged it into the school record player amplifier and it sounded great. I wanted to learn to play just like him. The first guitar I owned was an electric Hofter Futurama 2 and a friend called Steve showed me how to play Twist and Shout and this got me really interested in playing music properly. My school friends and I formed a rock band during our last year at school. Ian Mayer was bass guitarist and he built his own guitar amplifier from a circuit diagram that was published in the Practical Wireless magazine. He built the amplifier and I helped him build the speaker cabinet and that was used for our future gigs. Robbie Woods was our lead guitarist and Pete Mayhew from Aston Clinton was our drummer. I played rhythm and we played at the end of the term school dance at the Grange School. Our gym teacher, Mr Pottinger, organised that event and on that occasion, at the school do, Willie Barrett was our lead guitarist. He was the only one of us to make musical fame. He became known as Wild Willie Barrett and played music with John Otway. I put together my own guitar amplifier using a PA amplifier which I had stolen from a Catholic church from North Watford on the North Orbital Road. It didn't bother me, even though when my conscience spoke to me about it being wrong to steal, as I believed Catholics were wrong. Anyway, according to my mum that was, I had inherited, you see, a prejudice against the Catholic Church from my mum, and so when I took the amplifier, I ignored my conscience by saying to myself, they were wrong anyway. Our band was called The Fowler Moon. Willie Barrett's dad was a brilliant man, a musician and a craftsman. He made an excellent bass guitar for either Willie Barrett or his friend, and he wanted an amplifier for Willie's electric guitar and the bass player friend said he had a 30 watt amplifier, a linear Concord amp for sale, for a small amount of money. I jumped in quickly before they had made up their mind and bought it from the man. However, I then agreed to sell my 15 watt amplifier, which was half the power of the one I'd just bought, the one that I'd stolen from the Catholic Church, 
for a bit less money, and they bought it from me. I was very pleased, but felt a bit guilty because they had got a rough deal, and they really wanted to have the 30 watt amplifier, which was much better than mine. Little did they know I had stolen the amplifier. The Fowler Mean After leaving school, we reformed the group and began to play music at various dance halls, and I named our group the Fowler Mean and by this time we had a new singer called Malcolm Kirkham, and we used to use my 30 watt amplifier for the PA system as I had been able to buy a Vox AC30 valve amp for my guitar. We often played at Court School of Dancing in George Street in Aylesbury and other various places in Aylesbury, in Tring and at the Bull's Head in Aston Clinton and the Anthony Hall too. One of the other bands that played at the Bull's Head was the Must Be Blues with the organist Pat Archer. We would play all the cover music by groups such as the Rolling Stones, The Who, The Small Faces, The Kinks, Otis Redding and John Lee Hooker. We played My Generation, but I know it was not quite right, and I never did find out how to play that properly or get the right chords to play it. The opening chords that we played were four downward strokes on a G, followed by four downward strokes on an F, but that is not right. I always thought if ever I meet Pete Townsend, I would ask him to show me how to play those opening chords. I really enjoyed playing with the band, but was eventually sacked, and it was then that Malcolm Kirkham and I began to knock around with each other, driving our scooters. When Malcolm Kirkham joined us, that made five in the band, and we used to go out together on our scooters. At that time, I had inherited my brother's scooter, as he was serving time in Rochester Borstal. It was a Lambretta TV175cc, and Malcolm had a 150cc new Lambretta, and we began to mix with the mods in Aylesbury and District. He had been sacked from our group because he messed about. Malcolm would always arrive late, never be on time to set up the equipment. He was always combing his hair or having his trousers pressed, and he generally fooled around, and that's why we nicknamed him Coco the Clown. Malcolm and I began to mix with the other lads in Aylesbury, and I soon found out that my brother was well known, and when it was made known that Mick Clark was my brother, it was like having a license to do and say anything. I was accepted. I was one of the boys. I recall the times when my brother and I told me of the parties that they used to have, and I began to want to get involved in all the fun. Pet pills, scooters, mod fashions, dances, girls and permissive sex, all of which I wanted and was a positive attraction to me, as we were looking for a good time in the world. The image I had of my brother was that he was a quite a character, and had a way with girls. I remember this was how I wanted to be and follow him in fame. I remember one impressive occasion, it must have been, I must have been 16 years old, and met one of Michael's friends, who was a mod. One Saturday night, outside the Grosvenor, he came dressed in his brightly coloured trousers, a black plastic mac, wearing girls' makeup around his eyes. It was all the thing to do, and I thought this was great, and I liked it. The normal mode of transport was either a Vespa or a Lambretta scooter with crash bars, and a backrest, a spare wheel carrier, and mirrors. The scooters would be custom sprayed, and generally a World War Green Army Parker anorak or a black plastic cape was uniform. All of this was the world that I wanted to be in. I remember my brother coming to see us at Rockley Sands in Bournemouth when I was away on my holiday with my parents. I must have been about 15 years old. He came dressed in a brown suit with 22-inch Oxford bag trousers with small turn-ups. His top was a white crew-necked and white striped t-shirt, also brown brogue leather shoes. This was some fashion that I had never seen before. This was the mod fashion. He told me they had to return to Aylesbury to do some repairs and tidy up Mum and Dad's house, as they had had a party and the place had been wrecked. Apparently, all the Aylesbury mods from the district had been to his party at Mum and Dad's house. They had rolled up the carpets and put all the furniture in the garage, but the bathroom sink had been pulled off the wall as some girl had got drunk and sat in it. He told me of all the promiscuity and all that seemed good fun. This was the year 1963 or 4 when the Beatles and the Rolling Stones came to fame. Also, Joe and the Pacemakers had a hit number called I Like It. Shortly after this, I remember my brother coming home about 9.30pm in a hurry. My parents were away. In came my brother and he told me of his narrow escape from the police. About six of his friends had been out 
in an old car, not taxed or insured. They were joyriding when the police had stopped them along the Tring Road. They had all jumped out and made a run for it. It was soon after this that my brother got sent to Borstal for some crime or other. Nevertheless, it all seemed a good lifestyle and I wanted more of it.